Okay, uh, welcome to our uh, workshop today where we will be teaching you about um, the, giving you an introduction to AI and machine learning for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, this is part of a, a week-long workshop um, co-hosted by uh, the AI for LAM community and uh, Lieber. Okay, so um, before we get started, um, I'm gonna have our um, instructors introduce themselves um, and you can hopefully see their, their videos now. So uh, we'll go left to right in the order that we'll uh, be presenting today. So um, go ahead, uh, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, or good, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, uh, my name is Mark Bell. I'm a senior digital researcher at the National Archives in the UK. Great, great. And I'm uh, Mike Trisna. I'm a data scientist with the um, Smithsonian Institution um, in a, a group called the uh, Data Science Lab there. And I'm uh, Nora McGregor, and I'm a digital curator at the British Library, and I've been running a digital scholarship training program for staff there for um, just on a decade now. So um, we're looking to add this to our um, our um, offering for staff. Uh, I'm Daniel Van Streen, so I'm the digital curator for the Living Machines project, uh, and I'm based at the British Library. Hey, great. So the reason I, I pointed out the instructors first um, is because uh, this workshop today will be following uh, two different codes of conduct. Um, so the AI for LAM um, has a, a code of conduct, which is, is linked in that um, document that I, I put in the chat. Um, and also the Carpentries uh, code of conduct, because this is loosely affiliated with the Carpentries organization. Um, you can read the full text. It's kind of um, extensive, but uh, they can both be summarized as um, we're seeking to foster a positive and supporting supportive environment for you, for you all to, to learn better. Um, so be kind to each other. Um, if, if you feel that um, someone else is, is harassing you, making you feel uncomfortable, um, let one of the instructors know. That's why we introduced ourselves first. Um, uh, if you feel that one of us is violating the code of conduct, um, you can contact uh, somebody from the event organizing uh, team at uh, AI for LAM or Lieber um, we have the email address for the AI for LAM secretariat uh, here. Um, we don't foresee this being an issue, but I wanted to, to lay that out at, as a, a starting foot uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, so some logistics for the workshop today. Um, so this is being recorded. Um, you probably got a... a scary Zoom pop-up uh, window when you, you joined, um, letting you know that it's being recorded. So it's really no secret. Um, and we'll be uh, sending everyone a, a link afterwards. So if there's something that you, you missed, um, you wanna watch at, at half speed to make sure um, that you, you really uh, get some of the concepts, you can go back and, and watch afterwards. Um, and some of us will be uh, using slides uh, during our sections. Um, and we will be uh, posting those to the, the Lieber uh, Zenodo page. And again, this will be provided in an email after the workshop. Um, if you have any questions uh, throughout the, the workshop, uh, we ask that you uh, put them in the, the Zoom chat box. Uh, we'll, we'll have uh, people monitoring that chat box um, to, to answer those. Um, and uh, we'll have the, the helpers speak up to, um, to tell the instructor if, if it's something that needs to be ad addressed um, during the actual presentations. Okay, so a, a little bit about this uh, workshop. Um, this is a beta test. Um, we put that in the, the uh, registration page to make sure that everyone kind of knows what they're um, getting involved in here. So. Our group um, here, the, the four of us instructors, all um, applied to join uh, the Carpentries Lesson Development Study Group um, and uh, indicated in that application that we wanted to um, independently in, uh, indicated that we wanted to uh, 
develop an intro to machine learning uh, course. We were all paired together and we've been working since um, February um, to, to develop uh, this lesson. Um, and we've been learning a lot of things along the way about what makes a good lesson. Um, and, and this is our first time uh, teaching it. Um, so the lesson as it is, is part of the Carpentry's incubators um, system. You may have heard of library carpentry, data carpentry, software carpentry. Um, it's a, they're all organizations to teach uh, data and software skills. Um, we're in none of those right now. We're in an incubator um, um, hoping to eventually become part of the library carpentry system. Um, but as it is right now, this is not reviewed by or endorsed by the carpenters. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, and because this is a beta test, we would love your feedback. Um, so we're, we're gonna be um, circulating a survey at the, at the end to all of you um, to provide formal feedback. Um, but as we're going along, please um, write down notes of, of anything that you think could be clarified. Um, if we um, spent too long on a subject, um, spent not enough time on a subject, write that down as, as we're going. Um, we're gonna be writing lots of notes to ourselves, but um, feedback will, will make this better. Um, and as um, Nora and Daniel, I think both said, they, we're, we're looking forward to, to putting this lesson out there for others to teach. Um, and uh, we wanna make it as, as good as possible for, for everyone to, to teach. Um, and then the, the timing, because this is our first time teaching it, we don't really know how long each of these uh, lessons is, or episodes as part of this lesson uh, are gonna take. So to make sure that everyone has the same chance to get through their material, we're going to give everyone 25 minutes. Um, that kind of breaks down evenly, um, which means we are going to cut off each episode at 25 minutes regardless of if we've made it through all the episodes. So it may feel a little abrupt that we will just stop before the end. Um, we apologize for that ahead of time, um, but the, the material is all linked in that uh, document, that Code EMD document that was linked in the chat. Um, and you can follow up with that afterwards. Okay, so speaking of the schedule, um, this is all here as well um, for your benefit. Um, we know that everyone's schedules are a little crazy now, working from home. Um, so we want to make this as predictable as possible. So um, we're going to be spending 10 minutes on this, um, this intro. Since I started two minutes after the hour, I'm, I guess, already on schedule. Um, and then, like I said, 25 minutes each. Um, we'll have a break at the hour um, for five minutes. Um, then we'll uh, have a little bit of time at the end to fill in the survey. Um, and then at, at two hours, we're, we're going to um, cut it off. But you're welcome to, to stick around and provide kind of live feedback um, in addition to the survey. If you want to ask us questions, um, we'll, we'll stick around for a little bit afterwards. OK, so that is the introduction. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box. And we will, to reiterate, we'll be sending a recording and the slides out to all the participants uh, afterwards. Okay, any questions before I, I hand it over to, to Mark? Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> um, yeah, so as Mike said, I may fly through some of these, um, these slides, but they will be available. Right. Um, so the general uh, lesson objectives are um, to talk about, introduce uh, artificial intelligence and um, machine learning, um, and then look at how uh, machine learning um, is, got, is a subfield of, of AI um, and different types of machine learning. Um, and then we're going to talk sort of at, at the end about um, how machine learning is often about modeling your data. And this, but there's also some um, kind of problems with uh, terminology that we'll try and unpick as well. Um, so this slide is really about um, where it, it, machine learning kind of fits into a much bigger field of AI, um, which comprises of things including logic, um, probability, um, and um, machine learning, 
And within machine learning, you also have deep learning. Um, and some of these um, things around the outside are just kind of give you some of the historical perspective of AI, because although the term um, was, was kind of first termed in, in 1956, um, it feels like a very modern uh, pursuit, but actually um, you can, can stretch some of the bit, bits back all the way back to Aristotle in ancient Greece. Um, so an AI system, um, I think for me, is, is a system that takes, takes some input, it'll interpret that input, and then it will reason over what it's interpreted and then make some kind of decision. Um, and there'll be some kind of response to that decision. Some, something will um, come back to it and it'll learn from, from what it's um, experienced given its decision. Um, and we're really gonna focus on the, the learning aspect, but I think machine learning actually really fits in the in interpretation um, side. And in a lot of glam, glam um, applications of machine learning, that's exactly what we're doing. We're interpreting documents or images or, or something like that, but we do very little of the other bits, um, like reasoning and decision-making. Um, so here are a few sort of um, points for why we might need machine learning. Um, so if you take the logic part of AI, you can, you can build lots of complex rules um, and, and to help you make decisions. So here I've got a, it's raining, so I'm going to carry an umbrella. Um, but logical rules, there, there were some systems in the 1980s were called expert systems, which built very complex logical rules. But the world, the world is not quite um, <laughs> kind of binary, true or false decisions. So um, you have to add in probability to, to kind of deal with some of the uncertainty in the world. So then I might say I might, it might rain today, so then I'm going to take a decision whether I should take an umbrella or not. Um, but if you can, it, you can quickly imagine things where it's a bit of probability and some logical rules still doesn't help solve some um, complex tasks. And the kind of things we're doing is things like identifying um, paintings which have umbrellas in them. Um, so if you think of an umbrella, um, you know how would you how would you build some rules around what an umbrella is to um, help, a, help a program decide whether pictures contain umbrellas or not. Um, so if you can kind of have a, th have a think about what an umbrella is, think of one you might have at home, think of what color it is, what shape it is. Um, you know, is it is a parasol? Would you count a parasol as an umbrella? Um, and you quickly realize that it's, it's very difficult to come up with specific rules. So this is where machine learning um, kind of comes into into its own in that what we do is actually we we just provide examples of umbrellas and it learns what an umbrella is um, rather than us having to try and specify all the different types of umbrellas there are. Um, so there are four types of um, machine learning. Um, we've got supervised learning, which is learning by example. Um, so that would be kind of the previous example of um, learning by seeing lots of pictures of umbrellas. Um, unsupervised learning, where you ask a, an algorithm to kind of group up split out your data, cluster it or um, partition it in some way, um, but you don't give it much guidance over how you want that to, to be achieved. Um, Semi-supervised, which um, all the textbooks always say, this exists, but it's out of scope, um, and I'm going to do the same thing. Um, it's a kind of combination of the two. Um, and then reinforcement learning at the end, um, which we're not going to talk about, but is the, the one that's kind of most in the news, I think, at the moment, um, is the kind of Thing, uh, machine learning which kind of interacts with the environment and learns from its environment, and learns how to play chess and go and drive cars. Um, but we're going to focus on the first two of supervised and unsupervised. Um, so this is an activity um, that I was going to do a breakout room, but I think in the interest of time, I thought we could um, go into, I've pasted these um, tasks into the CodeMD document. Um, and if anyone wants to Open that, open that document. And I thought what we could do is, if people could put an, like an X next to the ones that they think you would use machine learning for. Um, it's, just, it's to get an idea of um, uh, kind of perceptions of, of, of machine learning and what, what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, so the possibilities here are um, a system for kind of counting people in and out of a museum, um, using information from the entry and exit barriers. Um, search system that looks for images similar to a, a user submitted sketch or doodle. Um, a system that recommends library books based on what other users have ordered. Um, a queuing system that spreads people evenly between five ticket booths. Um, a program that extracts names from documents 
by finding all capitalized words and checking them against a list of known names. Um, a system which turns digitized handwritten documents into searchable text. Um, and a robot which cleans the vases in the museum without knocking them over. Um, we'll just have a, like a, a, a minute or two if um, everyone's able to access the Pod PodiMD document, which I think there's a link in the chat. Um, and just put, yeah, stick an X to the ones that you think are machine learning. Looks like we're getting some fairly consistent answers there, which is good. Um, so we've got um, a lot of votes for the search system that takes a sketch. Can't actually see what's coming in the front because I've got pictures of faces in front of me. But um, the um, but I can see the the robot um, is definitely a, definitely sounds like that's using machine learning, um, and that one would probably be an example of a reinforcement that I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, so that looks. I think I think those people have a sort of good intuition um, what's happening there. So I'll show you on the next slide are the ones that I would say would um, use machine learning. The others I think you could build with just rules. Um, okay, so we can break machine learning, the kind of thing it's doing into um, two main tasks, either prediction or classification. Um, prediction is really um, generally with numerical data, um, such as predicting um, you know, te temperatures or um, the, yeah, num numerical values, um, and which is we tend not to use so much in, in glam settings, but there's certainly um, areas where, where it can be applied. Um, and most of what we're doing is classification. So this is labeling pictures by what type of picture they are, or documents by what kind of document they are. Um, and here's an example of um, the two um, two types. So this is this is a prediction task where I'm, I want to go um, on holiday, but I don't know the temperature of the place I want to go on. So I'm gonna take some data of um, places, places in the world, what temperature they are in the month I'm going. Um, I'm gonna use some, I'm gonna train machine learning algorithms to work out the pattern or some kind of relationship between uh, latitude, longitude, and the temperature. And then I'm gonna stick my um, country in and I'll get a number out which will tell me the temperature and then I'll decide whether I'll go on holiday based on that. Um, Whereas the classification um, version might use exactly the same data, but this time I just want a rating. I want to know whether it's a good or a bad holiday. Um, and in this case, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not interested in the temperature. I'm just interested in whether um, I, I would like that as a de destination or not. And I'll be based on previous holidays I've had. Um, so those are examples of supervised learning, where what we're doing is taking some um, past examples and we're passing them to a um, classifying algorithm and that's going to learn patterns in the data that help to predict the the outputs so here i've got some examples of um, classification tasks including sentiment analysis if you're trying to work out if your uh, reviews are happy or or, or settle positive or negative reviews um, you'd give um, a set of features which would be the words in each review um, you're telling it what um, what the outputs are, whether labels are positive or negative, and then what your algorithm might learn is some kind of relationship, correlation between um, the words happy or glad um, and the positive class. Um, or you could take um, paintings, which will use the um, the images of paintings and um, predict a kind of um, some kind of uh, label for those. Um, whereas a prediction class would take some numerical data, say the age of a child and um, predict the height of a child um, based on data. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, is where I give it, I give it some data and I just give it a target. I just ask the algorithm to, to split my data into a certain number of groups, say 10 different groups or, or five, it can be anything. And often you will experiment with how many, however many, because it's a sort of dark art to, uh, to predict how many is the best clustering of a, um, some data. Um, and all it will do is just split up your data or cluster, cluster it and you can draw um, some nice, nice pictures of data clustered together. Um, but you don't have much influence over how it clusters things. Um, and so the this following activity, which I'm not gonna, we're not going to do now, um, but this would be the kind of task that a clustering algorithm may, may do, where you would um, say that the task here is to um, take some, you've got two dinner tables, You've got six people and you've got to split them 
evenly between um, two tables. And if you and if you looked at um, and you've got to do it by the similarity of their interests. Um, and if you quickly kind of scan through the list of interests here, you can see there are probably four or five different ways that you could cluster people together. Um, and the, the point is you wouldn't have control over which of those five different ways you would just get the one that the algorithm considers to be the best. Um, but it's it's got advantages. So one of the advantages is that you don't need any training data. You just give your data um, to the algorithm and it will separate things out. And it's great for finding patterns and getting a high level view of a, of a data set that you haven't looked at before. Um, choosing the right kind of clustering is, is difficult, but um, there are methods for um, trying to find the optimum uh, grouping. Um, whereas supervised learning, we, we kind of define the category, we tell it which um, groups we want in, in advance, we give it labels. Um, the downside is it's quite resource intensive to label, label our data. Um, so if you think of some of these tasks before, um, it, but at the bottom here, um, transcribing 100 pages of handwritten medieval documents would probably take you um, quite a long time, even if you um, are a medieval expert. Um, tagging 10,000 images to say, say if they contain a, an umbrella or not, um, or even sort of wrangling some data from someone else's website or pulling together different sources is quite, quite expensive tasks. Um, so this is another activity I'm going to skip over, but um, it's kind of fill in the blanks for um, just to kind of summarize the uh, types of learning we've used, learned so far. Um, so it's kind of the, the, one of the kind of um, key points of the lesson is the some of the um, terminology. So um, people often talk a lot about mod models and algorithm, algorithms and machine learning. Um, so a model can have a number of different uh, meanings. So I'm going to break it down into a conceptual model and a trained model. And then sort of in between the two is an algorithm. Um, so the simplest example of an, a model I could possibly come up with is an average. Um, we, you know, we use, use these all the, all the time, probably learned it at school. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a model of some data, just an average of some data. Um, the algorithm is that we add up the numbers and divide by how many numbers we had. Um, and the train model is, an, is a number. Um, it's, the, it's just the, the average. And so if I was going to predict the height of the next person to enter the room, um, neglecting for a fact that I'm, I'm at home and I know exactly the next person to enter the room will be, um, I, um, I can use my trained model to, which will, all it will do is return the average height. And that would be my best guess of um, the height of person who will come in to the room. Um, so I'm going to kind of expand on this now with um, some uh, kind of drawing lines through dots, which is um, otherwise known as linear regression, um, which is a, a common uh, uh, machine learning method that comes from sort of statistics. Um, and again, it's the sort of thing we've pro probably um, done at school as well. Um, and But usually with just a pen and some graph paper. Um, so I'm going to talk about four different models and make points about each one. And these are not going to be particularly applicable to um, the kind of kind of things we might want to do in machine learning in GLAM, but the the, the concepts follow through to um, you know bigger and better things that we that we'd want to use with AI. So the first model, um, I've what the, what I've got here is that what I've done is I've I've made a kind of random function and I've generated some data out of it. So I've got fifteen um, training data examples. Um, in the real world, you wouldn't know what the what the, the, the generating function is at all. You wouldn't know what, um, what it created the data and your, the point of machine learning is to try and predict what it was. Um, so I've got 15 training examples and I've picked a, a model of, of the world, which is my um, model that says uh, my line is allowed to curve twice. And, um, and I've fitted it using an algorithm to, um, to, to fit through those points as best as it can. I mean, it actually fits pretty well because um, I, I knew what the right answer was. Um, but you can see here we've got a nice model with limited amounts of data. If I had only three um, data points, very small amount of training data, I would have to compromise on the complexity of the model. So here I've got a um, straight line model, no curves are allowed in, in this one. Um, it actually doesn't fit well to the, the real data at all. Um, we call that underfitting, um, but it's the best I can do given the data. And for my purposes, it might just be enough. Um, 
and that's one of the kind of lessons that we need to learn is if if you've got limited amounts of data sometimes you you compromise but it might just do what you need to do um my third model is um, i've got 30 training data, data examples this time and i've picked a really high complexity model i'm allowed 12 different curves in it um so i can really kind of follow that data very well the problem is it it actually fits too well because we know what the, the real answer is and we call this all overfitting um, and this wouldn't generalize to new data and that's one of the things we're trying to um, achieve with tra uh, machine learning we get given some data to learn from but we want it to work in the real world um, for data we've never seen before or your algorithms never seen before um, if i gave that same complex model 500 training data examples it actually now learns my learns very well fits a perfect nice um, smooth curve which is um, spookily similar to model a um, and the point is here you can use a very complex model so you can do some really complex things um, but you need lots of data to get them to work and sometimes you don't need the complex model sometimes it's nice to start simple and add complexity as you get more data um, so going back to what I was, um, was talking about with the average, here we have um, the same terminology of conceptual model. Um, when, so an example would be a line with two curves, would be my conceptual model, um, an algorithm, um, it's called least squares, which is um, hundreds of years old now, um, a trained model, which is the formula that would draw that line on the screen between the dots. Um, and my use case would be just, I want to predict something from the data, uh, the data goes in. Notice it doesn't matter what the axes on any of those graphs mean, or it doesn't matter what Y and X is. If you have numerical data that kind of fits this pattern, it will work. The, the algorithms don't care what your data really means. Um, and for predict, then I would use it to predict, I just stick my, my data into, my input data into the formula, and I'll get an answer out. Um, so I talked a bit about um, the amount of data that you need um, and how you're kind of limited, um, but we can, um, you're limited by your data really, but um, we, we can kind of leverage our human knowledge. Um, so when you're, when you're talking with um, sort of what we call classical machine learning, which is um, sort of the um, stuff that we've been doing for, for a long time, several decades, um, domain knowledge is, is really important and you can use something called feature engineering, where you can um, get the most out of your data, most of the bang for your buck out of your data um, to get to get good answers by putting your own knowledge. And I've just got an example um, with um, using dates. So to a computer, a date is is a number. It's usually a sequential number from some point in the past. Um, and so there's we haven't got all that uh, kind of periodic information that you would normally and um, that we we read from from a date. Um, so here's an example of some feature engineering. Where you can turn a date into um, months, days, months, days, week, um, holiday indicators, seasons, um, and all sorts, and and that would help your um, you're giving it a little bit of extra knowledge to help get the best out of your training data. I think that's pretty much. It. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, Mark covered. Um, in, in the previous episode, uh, what, what are artificial intelligence and machine learning? Um, and now I'm going to get into some uh, more concrete examples of uh, what, what types of tasks machine learning are good at, um, especially in the, the GLAM fields. Okay. Um, so one way to um, separate the type of uh, tasks that uh, machine learning is, is good at um, is to look at the different data types that are um, uh, used as input into uh, the algorithms that, that Mark talked about. So um, in that, that last example where he showed uh, dates, um, it, you may have seen in the back, that was, that was a, a spreadsheet um, and that is uh, tabular data. So tabular data is, is any kind of data that has rows and, and columns um, that is uh, used um, in, in more traditional uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. 
Um, some examples uh, from GLAM uh, communities might be uh, metadata um, or uh, time series data as well. Um, so that, that last example actually was a time series data where it showed different values at different dates. Um, and that could be used to, to predict what is a value in the future based on a, a few um, input uh, parameters. Um, and then uh, kind of more and more often now, uh, people are using uh, machine learning for um, images, um, which is known as computer vision, um, and also for handling uh, text, which is known as natural language processing. And we'll get more into those later. Um, and believe it or not, um, you, you may be thinking of other applications for machine learning on other um, data sets, but they kind of actually boil down into uh, one of these three. So uh, you may think about uh, voice recognition. Um, in that case, uh, a lot of times the, uh, the sounds of your voice are actually converted into images of like the spectrograph of, of how you're talking. And then it's classified into words with natural language processing. It's all kind of connected here. Um, video is really just a lot of images right next to each other. Um, and then a, a lot of uh, sensor data can be turned into um, tabular data as well. OK, so um, I think Mark mentioned this term um, in, in his uh, presentation. So. There's this term classical machine learning. Um, and that refers to uh, machine learning done on tabular data. Um, there are a lot of um, algorithms out there that all have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, there's this um, term that I, I didn't include um, in here uh, called the, the no free lunch theorem that says that there is no one algorithm that works best on all kinds of uh, data types. Um, you, you really have to figure out which algorithm is, is best for the amount of data you have, um, how balanced uh, your classes are, and, and things like that. Um, choosing the correct algorithm requires a lot of testing and validation. Um, that being said, there, there are a lot of algorithms out there to choose from, but they can often be bundled together. So you can um, choose to make a prediction with a... Or, create a model um, with a, a linear regression and uh, maybe a random forest model on the same data. And what you can do is you can combine those models together in what is called ensemble modeling. So you can kind of get two different predictions um, or several different predictions and, and choose the, the most common prediction. Um, and that itself um, becomes a, a stronger um, a more accurate um, prediction usually. Um, but keeping that in mind, that ensemble approach, um, what has happened recently um, that you've probably heard a lot about is uh, this uh, idea of deep learning. So deep learning is kind of like a super powered ensemble model where um, it's, it's actually built on uh, neural networks um, where um, a lot of different neural networks are connected together um, to do either some sort of trans transformation of the data or um, uh, model or kind of act as individual models itself and pass it on to a next layer. So um, in, in this very simplified uh, diagram here, um, you have your input data um, and you have lots of different uh, you're usually passing a lot of data to it um, in the case of uh, images and, and text. Um, a lot of transformations are being done. Um, and in the very end, you, you get some sort of output. Um, and it depends on what you're doing with your data on, on what that output um, will look like. So that's a totally simplified version. Um, we kind of promise no math required, um, so we won't get into the math, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to, to this later. Okay, so um, computer vision um, is defined as machine learning on images. 
Um, so in a way, actually, you can, you can think of image data as tabular data. So you have rows and columns are um, all pixel values. So um, if you've ever, I don't know, looked really behind the scenes of like a, a, a JPEG uh, format of an image, um, you have numbers from zero to 255 um, that um, represent light to dark, right? Um, and that kind of is, is the way that you are transforming an image into numbers um, because all of these algorithms only work with numerical input. So um, the specific kind of deep learning we do with uh, images um, has mostly focused on um, a, a type of deep learning uh, called convolutional neural networks. So um, in, in this way, um, you, your input data uh, is, is in a matrix format. So uh, rows and, and columns of, of pixel values. Um, and then a, a type of uh, math is done on those uh, pixel values called convolutions that basically compare each pixel value to the ones around it, right? Um, I, and I unfortunately don't have an example of this, but what you end up with is a representation of where edges are. So you can, as you do more and more convolutions on an image, um, the computer is able to, uh, to learn where the edges are, what shapes are, um, and things like that. So you can kind of um, call this like automated feature engineering. So it is taking a, a, a pile of these um, pixel values and it is pulling features out of it automatically. Okay, so some of the things that you can do with um, computer vision are at, at the very end, you're gonna end up with um, your, your output layer. You're gonna end up with a, a lot of, um, I guess if you are classifying an image, um, you're gonna train it on, a, a, you're gonna choose a bunch of different uh, classes that your, your image can uh, be classified as. So in this case here, we have a newspaper, but say you have a bunch of documents. Um, you have a whole file on your, or a whole folder on your computer that is just full, filled with digitized documents and you have no clue what they are. Um, but uh, you wanna organize those into newspapers, magazines, and books, right? So you can train a computer vision model by um, giving it a lot of examples of newspapers, magazines, and books um, and it will go through that uh, uh, convolutional neural network and change the, the weight that are in the, the algorithm to, to produce um, output that, that gives you a percent probability of each one of these classes. So in this case here, um, it's based on the, the newspapers, magazines, and books it's seen. Um, it predicts, a, it gives you output that looks kind of like this, where it'll say like, 90% probability of a newspaper, um, and all of these that will hopefully add up to 100% um, probability. So um, not only do you have a, a quick answer that the computer thinks that this is newspaper, but you also have a, a sort of a, a confidence um, a value as well. So um, you can also think of a, a different scenario where you have um, maybe a next step in your classification where you have all of your newspapers, but you know that they came from um, several different um, publishers, right? Um, you could then pass all of your things that were classified as newspapers into this next algorithm um, and get uh, different probabilities there. So you can subdivide further. Um, and in this case, um, this make-believe um, algorithm uh, predicted uh, with 70% uh, probability that this um, newspaper um, front page came from the New York Tribune. Okay. So this is known as image classification, where you're just taking an image and putting it into kind of categories. Um, further down from that, um, you can also uh, kind of uh, do a little bit more advanced task of uh, called object detection, where you are looking within an image and looking for different categories within that image. 
right? So in, in this case, it's, uh, you can train a, uh, a CNN uh, to, to identify the, the nameplate, uh, which is, I guess, the, the headline or the, the name of the, the newspaper. Um, you can also have it um, recognize headlines or photographs or illustrations here. So um, this is, is really useful if you're, I don't know, doing a, a research project and maybe you want to look at uh, how advertisements um, changed over time um, in newspapers. But if you have just a load of newspapers, it's gonna take a long time to go one by one and pull out all the advertisements. But you can train an algorithm to identify the, the advertisements, pull those out automatically, and you, um, uh, your next step is, is a lot easier. Um, an, another one I, I wanted to point out here, um, another uh, computer vision task, that I didn't include in the slides actually. Um, I, I thought of it when I was setting my, um, my background is uh, known as style transfer. So you can actually um, provide a, a lot of um, examples of a certain style. So like a, a painting or a cartoon or something like that. And you can transfer that onto other images. So my background here, I'm, I'm like moving away so you can see my background if you, if you can. Um, I took a picture of the Smithsonian castle and I transferred on a style of a cartoon on it. And so that you kind of get this like um, this look where it's cartoonified. Okay, so our first activity here. So in the notes on line 53 of, of the, the Cody MD, we have the same activity written here. And let's put in a link to this image. Um, all right, so I'm gonna create your breakout rooms automatically. And let's take um, five minutes to go through and think of um, what types of tasks you can do with an image like this. Um, and, and then kind of extrapolate it a little bit more. We have, um, of course, this didn't show up well in the presentation view, but there are a lot of um, drawers of bird specimens. Um, imagine if you had an overhead view of all of these bird specimens, what you, what you could do with that to speed up a digitization process. Okay, so I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms and we'll have five minutes. So we'll come back at 52 minutes after the hour, introduce yourselves to the other people in the breakout rooms, talk about what you can do, any other types of image, um, computer vision tasks um, that might be applicable in your work. And then we'll come back at 52 minutes after the hour. Okay, so there is looking through the um, this Cody MD um, document. There are some really great um, examples here. So I'm going to read some of them out loud so that they get recorded. Um, so uh, one of the options here is to detect the colors in there. Um, I hadn't even thought about that. There are a lot of different uh, color birds in there. Um, uh, counting the birds is is a great uh, task. Um, possibly identifying the bird species, um, uh, measuring the birds as well. Um, and then one that I, I was hoping that somebody would, would pick up on this was um, uh, taking into account the people in the photo. So uh, we will get into types of bias and ethics um, in the le next lesson, um, but having a uh, people in this image is, is uh, where a lot of the technology is, is kind of being written towards being able to, to recognize faces. Um, and it's, it's good to see an example of, of how you might have faces in images that where you might not expect them, but um, uh, this could bring up privacy concerns and, and things like that. Okay, so now the other half of uh, deep learning uh, or data types are is um, natural language processing. Um, so this is machine learning on text data. Um, and you'll often see this referred to as um, NLP um, because I guess computer scientists, data scientists really, really love acronyms. So we have CV, NLP, um, AI, ML. Um, so uh, hopefully we're, um, we're not using these too shorthandedly, but um, natural language processing is. 
So um, traditionally, um, natural language processing is, has been around um, since before uh, deep learning was uh, created. Um, and remember that uh, machine learning algorithms require numerical inputs. So how do we get numerical data from text? So the um, traditional way of doing this is to use a uh, technique called a bag of words, um, where you say you, you have a document or, or even like a small paragraph. Um, a, a kind of a canonical example is a, a review on a, um, a, a product website. Um, you have a lot of words in there and you can uh, count those words and you can uh, classify them based on machine learning. So you can um, count the number of times that uh, a positive word was used or negative words and then add all that up um, and you can get kind of a, a representation of a, if a review was positive or negative. And that's a lot faster way of kind of judging um, if, if people are reviewing a, a product well or not. Um, however, um, all of those words are, are treated individually. Um, you, you can uh, use, uh, I guess, pairs of words or, or um, three words together and classify those. Um, but eventually the math starts getting too hard. Um, and this is where deep learning comes in to um, actually uh, think about these words in context, right? So you're able to look at an entire document and pull out uh, what's called word embeddings. So these are long vectors of, of values for, for all of the words. And it's based on their context. Like what are the words around them? Uh, your um, your uh, vectors are going to change based on on the words around them. So um, some common uh, types of tasks you can do with um, machine learning uh, with text is uh, sentiment analysis, which I um, mentioned. Uh, so it's it's judging uh, if a, a piece of text is is positive or negative. Um, that's kind of the a simplified version. Uh, you can also uh, think about a lot of different, uh, uh, more complex emotions that you can put on uh, text. Um, you can also uh, do named entity recognition. So this is where you're looking at uh, looking for names or um, I guess proper nouns. So pulling out countries, companies, things like that. Um, this. Uh, there was a lot of work put into this um, to, in the finance sector where there, people are looking for news about companies and, and making instant stock trades based on uh, whether uh, there's positive news about a company or, or negative news, um, being the first to, to sell all of your stock based on that. Um, language translation is, is big, so taking uh, text in, in uh, one language and translating it to another language um, uses um, NLP and also um, summarizing information. So if you have a document, um, a, a very long paper, um, you can put it through a machine learning algorithm and, and kind of pull out what is, uh, what is the summary of this. Um, maybe write your abstract um, automatically someday um, or, or uh, to uh, do some topic analysis too, to, to put some uh, keywords on, on uh, uh, documents. So we, we are definitely running low on time. Um, here is a, an activity. Um, you can do it, I guess, we have a break coming up. You can do it during the break. This is on line 70 of the, of the Code EMD document. Um, and you can look through those examples and decide which ones um, you, you might need a deep learning um, algorithm with, or you can do them using the, the bag of words, um, kind of traditional, uh, algorithm that I, I mentioned earlier. Okay, so I wanted to mention here um, that one specific uh, example of uh, a, a GLAM uh, type of uh, application of machine learning is OCR. And I actually didn't write out what OCR stands for, but OCR is optical character recognition, um, uh, where you uh, have scanned in a, a text document turn it into an image, and now you wanna pull the text back out of it. Um, this is known as, uh, or this is called OCR. 
Um, and in this case, um, the, I guess the old way of doing things, uh, you would kind of look at each individual character, classify each one of those by itself into an A, B, C, or D, um, and put all those together and hopefully you have words. Um, more and more now they're combining computer vision and NLP to make sure that those letters um, and words actually make sense and that those words paired together make sense in context. Um, and that's where NLP comes in. And I'll just kind of blow through these last slides just so you see what's happening. I'm going to talk about generative models, um, producing new images and text. Um, and then uh, you can use unsupervised learning um, from deep learning to, to kind of uh, compute distances on um, images and, and text as well. Okay, so we're right at the hour, uh, according to my clock. So let's go ahead and take a five minute break. Hello there, my name is Nora McGregor and I'm a digital curator at the British Library. And this is my episode, my beta episode, Understanding and Managing Bias in Machine Learning. So today we'll be considering the following questions. What are the common types of bias and their effect in machine learning? At what points can bias enter the machine learning pipeline? And can we manage bias? Some lessons from and for the GLAM sector. At the end of the session, you'll be able to understand bias in the context of machine learning, identify common types of bias and how and at what stages these may impact model predictions, and consider a range of bias mitigation strategies available to GLAM staff. So bias in machine learning. Though AI and machine learning systems may appear to us as objective, dealing solely in facts and numbers, free from troublesome human proclivities in their decision making, there are abundant opportunities for human bias to enter ML systems at all stages of the pipeline. And human bias can have a broad and complex range of effects on the classification and prediction of models, as we'll see through a variety of examples, and it has consequences of varying degrees. Bias in AI can be understood in most general terms as an error where incorrect assumptions lead to systematically prejudiced results. So when we typically hear about bias in AI these days, particularly in the news, it's most often presented and understood in the context of societal prejudice and discrimination, where human prejudice in the development and application of algorithms results in the perpetuation of unfairness inequities and stereotypes of the real world, as has happened with predictive policing algorithms. But bias may exist in other forms, such as an image data set that inadvertently contains objects that always happen to appear in the center of the image, making it hard for a classifier to recognize objects that are not in the center of images. Bias may even be introduced to an algorithm in order to correct an unfair model. Consider an image search algorithm based on real world data where a majority of men happen to be CEOs. A user searching for CEO will find images of primarily men. A good bias may be introduced in order to ensure proper representation of a diversity of CEOs. In whatever form it takes, it's crucial for model builders to be able to identify bias and manage it. Let's take a look at that canonical example of algorithm algorithmic bias. So predictive policing algorithms. Machine learning systems are being relied upon as tools for courts to use in sentencing, aiming to predict the likelihood of defendants committing a future crime. Analysis by ProPublica in 2016 of one system used widely throughout the United States, COMPASS, the Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions Tool, uncovered significant racial disparity between the system predictions for white and black defendants. The compass tool assigns scores from one to 10 to a defendant based on over 100 or so factors, such as age, sex, and criminal history. Although notably race has been excluded. So the predictive policing algorithm was labeling white defendants as having a lower risk 
and an analysis turned up that the uh, majority did reoffend. Likewise, for Black defendants, they were labeled a higher risk and more often did not reoffend. So let's pause and, and have a think about this. Consider this riddle. A father and son get in a car crash and are rushed to the hospital. The father dies. The boy is taken to the operating room and the surgeon says, I can't operate on this boy because he's my son. How is this possible? Well, the surgeon is a woman. In research conducted on 197 BU psychology students where women outnumbered men two to one and 103 children aged seven to 17, only a small minority of the subjects were able to come up with this answer. Even more interesting of self-described feminists in the student group, a majority did not guess the surgeon was the mother. This illustrates how a training data set may unintentionally come to encode societal gender bias through human applied labels such as surgeon versus female surgeon. So although neural networks might be said to write their own programs, they do sort towards goals set by humans using data collected for human purposes. If that data is skewed even by accident, the computers will amplify an injustice. So what are some common type bias types in machine learning? Let's take a closer look at some specific and common types of bias that may manifest in the undertaking of machine learning approaches at your institution. This is, of course, a, only a small handful of potential sources. It's important for model builders to be vigilant about finding and remedying bias in whatever form it may enter the machine learning pipeline. Let's have a look at uh, confirmation bias. In the process of refining and reinforcing a model's learning, unconsciously or consciously processing data in ways that confirm pre-existing beliefs and hypotheses. So an example of that would be an engineer is building a model that predicts aggressiveness in dogs based on a variety of features such as height, weight, breed, environment. But the engineer had an unpleasant encounter with a hyperactive toy poodle as a child, and ever since has associated the breed with aggression. When the trained model predicted most toy poodles to be relatively docile, the engineer retrained the model several more times until it produced a result showing smaller poodles to be more violent. Another good example in this batch um, is selection bias. So, that is what introduced by the selection of individuals, groups, or data for analysis in such a way that proper randomization is not achieved, thereby ensuring that the sample obtained is not representative of the population intended to be analyzed. An example of this would be a model is trained to predict future sales of a new product line for the museum gift shop. To build the training set, the first 200 subscribers to the museum's newsletter were offered a small gift voucher to fill in a survey. Instead of randomly targeting consumers, the data set targets newsletter subscribers who don't necessarily represent the museum's potential paying customers. It's entirely possible the newsletter subscribers population may be more inclined to be signed up to learn about free events and giveaways, while typical consumers may not be enticed by small gift vouchers or even signed up at all. So when my human bias enter a machine learning pipeline, there are abundant opportunities for human bias to enter this pipeline. A lot of time we spend talking about data sets, but actually when the study is being designed is, a, is the first point. When data sets are constructed, when decisions are being made to refine and reinforce the model's learning, when interpreting and applying decisions made by the model to real world scenarios. Let's take a closer look at some of these. So bias can arise in the study design. Some machine learning systems are quite simply built on ethically unsound foundations from the outset. A recent controversial study tracking historical changes in trustworthiness using machine learning analysis of facial cues and paintings was published in Nature Communications and garnered significant controversy for its proximity to the thoroughly debunked pseudoscience phrenology which aims to assess an individual's personality, and are in this case of the study, trust based on facial structure. 
bias arising in data set collection and construction. Data is never neutral. It's about people and the manner in which data is sourced and constructed for training sets will have important implications on your model's output. Because of the many complexities around copyright and licensing, privacy issues, and high costs involved in getting access to large quantities of quality data sets, data scientists have favored scraping what they can find freely en masse and indiscriminately across the internet from open sources such as Wikipedia or Flickr or Google News. Data sets collected in this brute force manner will naturally reflect the biases of these sources based on their demographic and geographic composition. So you may end up with an overrepresentation of young internet users from developed countries, for example. When data is incomplete or skewed in any way, either intentionally or unintentionally, bias will arise. When training data is labeled and annotated, typically through some kind of crowdsourcing mechanism, such as Amazon's Mechanical Turk, and as we saw in the first activity, bias can crop up either consciously or unconsciously in the course of this. GLAM staff will be more than familiar with this phenomenon as we grapple with historical bias in library and archives descriptions, for instance. As demand for GLAM collections and catalog data for use in machine learning increases, it's vital that model builders are made aware of the biases that may be encoded within cultural heritage data. Whether personally undertaking or crowdsourcing your data annotation, it's important to be aware of how different demographics and social constructs may introduce bias and implicit associations into your pipeline. Now for an activity. We won't have time today, but I wanted to explain what um, the activity would entail in a real life classroom situation. So people will be asked to consider these four images and write a list of terms they would use to annotate each, then compare the outputs with their nearest neighbors, discussing the differences and how this could potentially affect a model. And how might you mitigate these differences in annotations? This actually comes from um, wedding photographs that were donated by Googlers that were labeled by a classifier trained on the Open Images data set. The classifier's label predictions are recorded, recorded below each image, and you can immediately see the problem here. Bias can arise when refining and reinforcing a model's learning. So machine learning models are refined and reinforced based on reactions to its results. In this process, there is a risk of certain outcomes being ignored and others privileged over others, skewing a model's learning. An example of this is a model builder is using named entity recognition across multilingual newspapers. They might determine that they're satisfied when the model gets to 90% accuracy and will aim to improve to this result. However, this overall accuracy can hide the fact that some particular slices of our data might have much worse accuracy. Your overall accuracy might be very good, but your model may underperform on one language. This might not be addressed by changing your data, but changing how you approach training and evaluating your model. Bias arising in the application of machine learning decisions to real world scenarios. Algorithmic bias is defined as unjust, unfair, or prejudicial treatment of people related to race, income, sexual orientation, religion, gender, and other characteristics historically associated with discrimination and marginalization, when and where they manifest in algorithmic systems and algorithmically aided decision making. This is a video we don't have time for today, but it's about Amazon. It's an example of this, um, where Amazon had an AI recruiting tool that showed bias against women. The tool was trained on resumes of, of successful candidates to Amazon. Unfortunately, most of those were men. So the, the algorithm had trouble identifying any female um, applicants as being a potential successful Amazon employee. How can 
Clinical GLAM staff help manage human bias and machine learning approaches. So the presence of human bias in the classifications and predictions of machine learning is clearly a challenge today. But being aware of and transparent about the problem allows us to take proactive steps to mitigate their effects. For GLAM professionals, this could be relatively familiar ground. And in reference lessons from archives, strategies for collecting sociocultural data in machine learning, the authors argue that the document collection practices and archives present the ideal ethical and practical framework for mitigating bias in data collection for the field of machine learning. GLAM professionals have an opportunity to apply these professional tools to the management of bias. Archives are the longest standing communal effort to gather human information and archive scholars have already developed the language and procedures to address and discuss many challenges pertaining to data collection, such as consent, power, inclusivity, transparency, and ethics and privacy. I highly recommend giving a read of Responsible Operations, Data Science, Machine Learning, and AI in Libraries, which outlines several great recommendations and is a great place to start. Other things to consider. GLAM institutions need to ensure a diverse workforce. Monoculture cannot effectively manage bias and diversity is not an option. It's an imperative. Hold symposia focused on surfacing historic and contemporary approaches to managing bias with an explicit social and technical focusing on the challenges libraries face it in managing bias while adapting technologies like computation, the internet, and currently with data science, machine learning, and AI. Contribute diverse language materials, collections, and texts to sources where model builders are finding their data, such as Wikipedia. Collaborate directly with computer science scientists to build new diverse curated data sets for use in machine learning. Enlist the help of staff with the right domain expertise to review training data construction before and after. They may see biases that have been overlooked. When collecting and annotating data, make sure to recruit diversified crowds for the task and carefully communicate instructions. Employ toolkits for detecting and removing bias from machine learning models. For instance, the IBM Open Source AI Fairness 360 tool. Consider your partnerships and collaborators closely, including ramifications of outsourcing your AI to external companies and partners. And know your data and be transparent about it by creating a data sheet, describing and documenting it in full. For our final activity, we would like everybody to break up into small groups and consider the following potential machine learning project. Discuss two or three points at which bias may enter the pipeline and question strategies GLAM staff might want to consider in order to manage it. An art museum is keen to make a newly acquired digitized collection of 20,000 Southeast Asian photographs more discoverable within the main museum image search. Aside from a collection level description, noting the provenance of the collection from a 19th century English explorer, the individual images have very little in the way of item level description, except for some captions ascribed by the collector. A model will be trained to classify these images. In order to build the training data set, the art museum is considering setting up a public crowdsourcing project. Um, asking members of the public to tag a set of images with as many descriptive words as they can. Thank you very much. And here's a list of the re resources consulted and recommended reading in the building of this episode. And thank you very much for uh, participating in this beta episode. Um, it will be, it's currently in the Carpentries Incubator and any feedback you give to us will help to refine it and improve it. And um, we look forward for your feedback. Thank you very much. So I'm going to try something a little bit different. Um, I might regret this, but let's see. Um, so I'm going to try this without slides, um, which I might 
um, tend to regret, but we'll see how this goes. Um, so in this lesson, we kind of move on from looking at the model part of the process and think about how we can actually take these various types of machine learning model um, and start applying them within a, a GLAM context. Um, so by the end of uh, this lesson in theory, we would have covered all of this, but I'm already pretty sure that we're gonna have to skip quite a few of the exercises and there's some parts of the lesson that I will skip over, um, but you should all have access to this. Um, so hopefully you can kind of follow up on anything that I skip over um, later on. Um, so yeah, as I said, the, um, the aim of this lesson is to kind of shift from this very focused um, view on uh, developing models and some of the considerations that need to go into that um, and look at this kind of broader idea of um, machine learning projects. So there's this slightly dubious report and I try to kind of find other ones, but this kind of report says that 85% of AI projects fail um, and this project's kind of written in the context of businesses trying to use um, AI or machine learning for a kind of particular business application. So this isn't talking so much about um, machine learning uh, research, but um, applications in business. Um, so I, I kind of put that there as a, a little bit of a, a thing to say that um, I think in a, a kind of business setting, applying machine learning and integrating machine learning into kind of products or services is still something that's very new and people are kind of struggling to do. And I think doing that in the context of a GLAM institution, which might have some even more challenging uh, considerations to um, yeah, take account of um, and potentially might have less resources um, at their disposal than a, um, a kind of commercial company. Uh, that, you know, it's quite challenging to actually deliver these successful projects. Um, but one other thing that um, was going to be a discussion exercise, but I, I won't do today, is just to kind of question a little bit um, what a, a failure would look like in your institution. Um, and I think, again, this is where uh, things might be slightly different in the context of um, deploying machine learning in a GLAM versus um, a company setting where what failure means might be quite different. So in a business, it might be clear that if your product doesn't make money, then you failed. Um, but in a GLAM setting, what failure and success means could be quite different. Uh, um, and I think this could be a useful thing to kind of keep in mind when you, uh, you know, approach a machine learning model, a uh, machine learning project. Um, so in this lesson, we kind of go through this slightly artificial um, pipeline of different steps and considerations that go into uh, a machine learning project. Um, and kind of machine learning projects within a GLAM context could be used in, in quite a broad range, uh, kind of starting from something that's relatively limited in scope to something that, you know, is some end-to-end -end major um, intervention in how uh, your GLAM uh, manages collections. Um, so this is my first point to apologize for my drawing skills. As you might have guessed, uh, I didn't have any formal art training. Um, so these hopefully won't make it into the final lesson. Um, but what I've tried to illustrate here is um, a kind of business need. So often uh, in a kind of in the guidance given to commercial projects when they're de de developing machine learning projects is to kind of start with this idea of a business need. So some problem that you want to tackle with machine learning and to try and be quite clear in what that, uh, what that need is. Um, and in a GLAM context, I think that doesn't always translate, but I think it's still quite a useful uh, way of thinking about um, how to use machine learning. Um, so in this example, um, a kind of problem that we're trying to tackle is that we've got this kind of pipeline, which is a little bit crude, but we're basically digitizing uh, books uh, and other documents. And when we get those, we also get some blank pages um, that are from those books. 
Um, and at the moment, we're just sending all the page images one by one to some kind of request uh, service where we can pay per image to get some OCR back. Um, and you can see that this blank image here kind of comes back as a slightly garbled mess um, because there's nothing to OCR on that page. And the other problem here is that we're paying um, for each request. So we're actually paying money to some company to OCR these pages when there's not gonna be any benefit in doing that because they're blank. So this is quite um, a small targeted problem, but this is uh, you know, one example of the kind of workflow where you might think that machine learning could potentially help you uh, address this problem by identifying um, pages which contain text and pages which are blank and making sure that you don't send these blank pages to uh, this service to get them OCR. Um, so that's one example that I've kind of given of the type of uh, application a GLAM might have uh, for machine learning. Um, so I won't go through all of these uh, in detail now, but it's just to point out that actually within this GLAM setting, we kind of have a lot of potential ways in which machine learning can be used. And these all kind of interact with collections, um, but also existing processes within an organization in quite different ways. Um, and I think because of that, the kind of implications of uh, that machine learning project might be quite different. So I think this is something important to keep in mind um, at, at the start of a uh, machine learning project. Um, so again, we'll skip over this exercise, but um, I suspect most of you will already have worked or have ideas about how machine learning could be used um, within your organization. Um, so we'll kind of skip over that today. Um, and the next thing that I kind of wanted to um, touch on was something that I think has already been uh, hinted at earlier, was this idea of uh, machine learning models producing predictions. And I think we're using slightly uh, different terminology uh, in different parts of the episode. So what I mean by prediction is all of the potential labels that a model could give, or it could be a number that it predicts. But in this case, we'll just think about labels. And quite often when you see the kind of outputs of these machine learning models, you see this kind of one label. So if you have a, a classifier of dogs and cats, then you see, okay, this model predicted this image was a cat. Um, but underneath, almost all machine learning models will actually assign a probability um, for each label. Um, so a kind of question when you're using these models then is that um, you don't have to directly use these predictions. There's different ways in which these predictions made by a model um, can actually be used. Um, so as a kind of example here, I don't know how clear my beautiful diagram is, but here I have this kind of uh, multilingual text. So imagine we've got um, newspapers that were published in multiple languages. So some articles might be in French, uh, some might be in Dutch, some might be English, some might be German. Um, and we have a model that tries to identify for each article what the likely language um, is going to be. Um, and as the output for that, we have these kind of language codes. So in this case, we have this first language code, 60%, and this second one, we have 40%. Um, so I think often the default uh, place people will go with this is to say, well, you know, we have this prediction, so we kind of have to use that uh, in some automatic way. So this is what this is trying to show, that you take this uh, predicted uh, language code and then integrate it into some kind of catalog and show users that language code as being associated um, with that article. Um, but alternatively, you could use that prediction uh, in very different ways. So an alternative would be to instead show these predictions to a cataloger as a kind of suggested um, language for each of those. And then the cataloger gets to decide whether to accept or reject those suggestions. Um, so here we've got some other kind of potential ways in which you could um, assemble these predictions into some kind of action. So 
You could also show the predicted language and confidence score to users, but uh, give them some way of feeding back whether that language code uh, looks right to them or not. Um, or you could choose to use this model confidence as a threshold to decide how to kind of treat that prediction. Um, so I've kind of labored this point quite a lot, but I think it's quite uh, an important consideration, particularly when we kind of go back to some of the issues that Nora has covered in the previous session, that quite often it's not going to be um, possible or, or you might have reservations about putting a machine learning system into a position where it can just change things uh, in a catalog or some other kind of public um, facing uh, interface. Um, but often there will be other ways of kind of using machine learning models that uh, still gives you a lot of benefits, but doesn't kind of um, yeah, put you in that risky position of uh, directly changing things. Um, so in the code EMD, um, hopefully uh, on line 115, I, I've kind of uh, copied those different ways in which you could potentially use predictions. So it's a very quick exercise. I thought we could, um, or people could just indicate within the kind of context of their GLAM institution, you know, which way uh, they would be most likely to use one of these predictions. If you put an X next to the kind of most likely way in which you would turn that prediction into some kind of action um, for your institution. So I'll break the ice and put mine here. So yeah, here there's really no um, right or wrong answer, at least I don't think there is. But um, yeah, again, the, the point I think I want to make here is that the way in which kind of machine learning becomes useful for your institution, you know, it goes back to this original problem you're trying to solve. Um, there'll also have to be quite a lot of nuance about where your institution is at. Um, and which one of these is most likely to be kind of uh, something that you can sell within your organization will also be something to consider. So this might be something that changes over time. Um, but I think it's an important point to consider as part of this process. Um, so I think I will uh, still try and do a very quick exercise. Um, so this kind of next bit of the kind of pipeline talks a little bit about um, people and skills that you're going to need um, to kind of successfully apply machining, machine learning in a GLAM setting. Um, so I'm going to put you in the breakout rooms uh, very quickly. So I think it will end up being less than five minutes. Um, but if you could jot down some ideas or discuss um, what you think some of the important skills might be, um, and also maybe uh, you don't have to write this in the document if you prefer not to, but where those skills might be uh, within your organization. So yeah, I'll give you uh, around five minutes to do that. Okay, so I hope that wasn't um, too abrupt as an exercise, um, but I'm hoping that, yeah, I mean, this is a slightly uh, weird artificial um, answer list. Um, but I'm hoping one of the takeaways, if you didn't already kind of share this um, opinion, is that you know a lot of the issues um, that you will face in a machine learning project um, won't just require kind of technical data science or machine learning skills, but will require um, you know domain expertise um, and all of these other skills that are going to be. Um, very essential and kind of going back to um, what Nora said in the kind of introductory part about the business need. I think it's actually very important that when uh, GLAM institutions have these machine learning uh, projects uh, that a broad range of people are involved because there's a danger that if there's a small group of people or one person that the project might be successful in terms of one kind of machine learning metric, but fails to deliver anything useful for the institution or potentially does something that's actually um, could be kind of considered harmful. So I think having this broad range of skills and people um, is 
kind of essential to make sure that these projects uh, are likely to be successful. Um, so here's a section where I'm going to skip over a few bits. So this is a little bit looking behind the curtain. Um, but this data and metrics section, um, I will kind of skip over today. Um, but we'll kind of uh, turn to this kind of question of, um, you know, how uh, you could go about deciding what kind of machine learning model um, or approach would be useful for you. Um, and again, I'll kind of brush over this quite quickly today, but one of the things that um, Mark already mentioned uh, a little bit was this idea of um, using kind of averages as a kind of very simple model. Um, and this could be quite important when you're thinking about using machine learning for a particular problem. So it depends what kind of business need you're trying to address, but um, ideally you will have some way of assessing whether that model is actually useful for that task uh, you're trying to solve. Um, and one way you could potentially do that is that there might already be a kind of other system in place that doesn't use machine learning, but uses some other kind of computational method um, to kind of do that process. And that could act as your benchmark if you kind of know roughly how well that system performs. But as a kind of very simple baseline, you might just want to do this thing that, that Mark mentioned, where you kind of take um, some mean value um, from your data and then use that as a kind of baseline to say that if my model is not doing any better or much better than this kind of baseline, then probably we need to rethink whether that model um, is useful. And the other thing that I think is very uh, important again here is to think back to how this model is going to be integrated um, into uh, existing systems or, or processes. So if you're using this model to directly make changes to catalog systems, you probably want a much higher performance than if this model is going to be used um, to kind of generate some derived data set where there can be a lot of kind of context shared uh, next to that data set about how it was generated um, and potential kind of issues uh, with that data. Um, so the last thing that I'm going to very uh, briefly try and talk about is um, this question of, um, you know, how you can kind of find models to use. So this kind of uh, touches on a few different topics. So one is uh, this kind of question of algorithms uh, that Mark and uh, Mike both touched on. Um, but then there's the kind of broader question of, you know, where these models are and how you can kind of access them. So again, uh, I have to apologize for uh, some of my uh, drawing skills. Let me just zoom out a bit here. Um, but what I've tried to show here is um, three different ways in which you can potentially feed some data, in this case, digitized newspapers into some kind of model and get back uh, some kind of predicted labels. Um, so in the top one, we're sending an image of this digitized newspaper to some kind of cloud provider. We get back a few different things. So this is supposed to be some kind of sentiment score. And then this is supposed to be uh, these named entities that, uh, that Mike mentioned earlier. So location organizations. And this is supposed to be showing this extracted image. Um, Another way we could potentially access some kind of machine learning model to kind of work with this data is through uh, a kind of some kind of application where this model might not be that prominently shown, but it's more kind of deeply embedded uh, within this system. Um, so in this case, you might have some kind of OCR engine um, where there's some machine learning involved in that process, but it's quite hidden. Um, and the final one um, is this kind of process where you take this input data and then here we're supposed to uh, see some kind of uh, Python code. Uh, and in this case, we're using an existing kind of Python library called Spacey to produce some predictions um, from that data. And I realize I've now completely uh, run out of time. 
but I'll try and uh, somewhat elegantly wrap up um, by kind of just saying that this section will kind of discuss some of the ways in which you might assess these various ways um, in which you might make a decision about which of these various approaches might be appropriate um, within your institutional setting. Um, and also I, I'd kind of recommend doing this exercise uh, in your own time if you haven't done it before. So this is to kind of use some of those umbrella images uh, that uh, we saw before. And uh, both of these uh, computer vision as an API services have some kind of demo places where you can upload images and see what kind of predictions you get back. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to, to look at those and see how they might be useful and how they might be limited um, within a kind of glam context. So I'm going to wrap up there uh, slightly uh, unceremoniously, but um, yeah, there's more here, but that, that, that's it for, for now. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we kind of warned everyone at the beginning that, the, that this <laughs> might happen. And I think it happened to all of us where we had to kind of leave some things for, for later, but hopefully, I mean, I, I personally learned a lot about the timing of my lesson. Um, and I, I think that was really valuable for all of us. Um, okay, so I put a, a link in the, in the chat um, with, uh, to the survey. So go ahead and open that up um, and start filling that out. I'm gonna do something terrible and like talk over you as you're filling out the survey, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to open it up at least. Um, so next steps for you, I mean, we gave a very high level overview of the machine learning, um, I guess I concepts, uh, things that it's good at, um, uh, but next steps to actually getting your hands dirty with machine learning, um, you're probably going to need to, to, uh, start getting familiar with a programming language. Um, if you're not already, um, such as Python or R. Um, there are great data carpentry and software carpentry lessons for those. Um, and and uh, I actually didn't link to those, but I, I pasted these into the, the Code EMT document. Um, and also within the Carpentries ecosystem, um, there are two other lessons going through the Carpentries incubator system along with ours that kind of this will this lesson will feed directly into. So uh, there's one on machine learning with Python and scikit-learn. Um, scikit-learn is the, the Python library used for the, the classical machine learning um, that I talked about. Um, and then there's also a, another lesson on deep learning uh, with Python. I believe it uses the, the PyTorch uh, uh, library. Oh, whoops. Okay, so the next steps for this lesson itself, um, uh, we're gonna. We're, we've been talking about adding another episode. Um, we cleanly had four um, with four instructors, so that worked out well. But um, adding another one on kind of like what is the ecosystem of uh, machine learning? So like what are what are the software packages that are out there? The data sets that are available, um, uh, freely available. The models that are available to to fine tune um, and. Also, why are those out there? What are the motivations behind uh, why everything is open source? Um, uh, Google and Facebook are putting like really advanced software out there, but why are they doing that? Um, and the answer is in order to get um, contribution back from people for free without um, paying their, their software developers. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, uh, and also we might even add to the lesson itself, next steps for learning, um, like our last slide we had there. Um, so our study group session that we're, we're in right now is um, uh, uh, supposed to uh, finish in, in mid-April. Um, so until then, we, I think we posted the, our lesson materials. Um, until then, go ahead and, and put things in, uh, in GitHub issues um, if you, if you want to uh, make suggestions. Um, we'll also probably take things from the surveys um, and convert those into issues. Um, so if you want to be included in that conversation, um, include your GitHub username in, um, in the last uh, question there so that we can tag you and um, get a uh, follow up on uh, uh, the suggestions you have. 
Um, and then at that point, we'll um, uh, go through a review process um, with the carpentries. And hopefully, eventually, we'll um, get the, the lesson added to um, the library carpentry um, uh, curriculum um, so that it can be taught by carpentries instructors at carpentries workshops. Um, having said that, the carpentries uh, model is for everything to be um, open source. Um, so anyone can technically teach this if they want to right now. I think it, it just has to be attributed. So. Like I said at the beginning, we, we very much are, are looking for your feedback and, and value your feedback. So here's the link again. We'd love to, to know more about that.